Tyrannosaurs are among the most famous non-avian dinosaurs, and for readily apparent reasons. Alongside their massive frames and formidable skulls, there is always one element which is noticed and often made fun of more so than probably any other animal in a recent history, that being their comparatively tiny arms, which have been a source of much humour ever since the animals were first described. This video will detail the history of the understanding of these structures and what they were used for, allowing for a greater appreciation of them in the process. Initially, the arms of Tyrannosaurus were not even known about until long after the holotype was described, with the humerus being the only element of the forelimbs known. For the initial mounted skeleton as seen by the public in 1915, Osborne, the describer of the genus, utilised the longer, three-fingered forelimbs like those of Allosaurus, as the now iconic two-fingered arms had not yet been discovered. A year earlier, however, paleontologist Lawrence Lambe had described the short, two-fingered forelimbs of the closely related Gorgosaurus, which, being largely complete, surprised Lambe, who stated there was no reason to believe any fingers were missing, even though he was quite confused. The bone that would have supported the third finger, one of the metacarpal bones, was nothing more than a vestigial splint, ruling out the possibility that it had been lost during fossilisation. Lambe was puzzled by why such a large animal, estimated to be around 26 feet long, had such puny two-fingered arms, and due to the close relation to Tyrannosaurus, it caused other paleontologists to revise what they thought about the arms of Tyrannosaurus. Citing his colleague Charles Gilmore in 1916, Osborne also noted that it was probable that Tyrannosaurus would prove to be functionally didactyl, meaning that the extra finger present in early restorations and reconstructions was eventually lost. This suggested, therefore, that Tyrannosaurus also had short arms with two fingers, although it was not until 1989 with the discovery of MOR 555, the Wankel Rex in 1989, where the first complete T. rex forelimbs were identified. This confirmation is a prime example of how paleontology and especially comparative anatomy works, as if a fossil species is incomplete in certain areas. Scientists are able to fill in the gaps if any related animals preserve a missing piece of anatomy, like parts of the tail, skull, or in this case, the arms. Hence why Tyrannosaurus has been depicted with their iconic small and two-fingered hands for the longest of times, even though they were not known of in Tyrannosaurus specifically, and were based on the as of the time more complete skeletons of their cousins, Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus. For decades, paleontologists have discussed and debated numerous theories of what these arms were used for, and this segment of the video will therefore cover some of the most plausible or most talked about. Osborne had already begun to formulate his own theory on the use of Tyrannosaur arms, when he only knew of the humerus, suggesting that the arms could have been used as a grasping organ to aid in copulation after he initially believes the humerus to not have been associated with the animal given its size. The bones showed large areas for muscle attachments and were themselves very thick, indicating considerable strength, with an arm being comparable to a human one but noted to be more powerful. They were also limited in terms of flexion, which would have helped in stabilising and holding onto a mate if there was any struggle, similar to how Basilosaurus is proposed to have used their small hind limbs to guide the animal's long bodies during mating. Another option, similar in regards to the previous hypothesis, is that the forelimbs could have been utilised to hold on to prey while the Tyrannosaur could then kill the victim with their enormous jaws. This hypothesis is similar to the previous idea in that it uses biomechanical evidence, looking at the forelimbs which exhibit extremely thick cortical bone, which has been interpreted as evidence that they were developed to withstand heavy loads, suggesting them to be able to lift around 180 kilograms, about the weight of a reindeer. The point that makes this hypothesis similar to the last is the idea that the limited range of motion and strength of the arms meant that they were useful in holding down a struggling animal, but instead of a mate, in this case, it would be prey. There is also another idea that tyrannosaurs would have been able to utilise their arms, alongside their massive bodies, to essentially cow-tip their prey. It was found that if a prey item, like a triceratops, were to be knocked over, as the structure of the legs does not allow them to place their feet under the centre of gravity, they would therefore be vulnerable for long enough so that the Tyrannosaurus could finish them off, with the results finding that an adult Tyrannosaurus moving at a moderate speed would have apparently produced more than enough force to knock over a large Triceratops. 
The research also found that Tyrannosaur arms from complete specimens possess pathologies and one, being Sue, had a torn tendon in the right arm, indicating that they were subject to extensive forces when the animals were alive. Tyrannosaurs are also notable for their proportionally large feet for theropods, which has led researchers to believe that this supports the cow tipping model, although we'll get into the secondary reasoning which is a more plausible explanation soon enough. A further idea that also ties into the grasping prey hypothesis is that tyrannosaurs would have used their arms for slashing at prey. This has been proposed by paleontologist Stephen Stanley, who went into detail on how tyrannosaurs would have used their small arms to tear into their prey and to inflict deep gashes up to a metre long and several centimetres deep within a few seconds, being able to do so multiple times in rapid succession. To make his case, he pointed out the strong arms as well as an unusual quasi-ball and socket joints, which would have allowed the arms to move in several directions. What's more, the loss of one of their three fingers during the course of evolution, according to Stanley, was done so that there was an increase of 50% in pressure being able to be applied by each of the two remaining claws. Other experts have however found criticism to this idea, with some, like Jacob Vinther, thinking that it seemed illogical to use such small arms to slash with, and that they would have been awkward to utilise. Thomas Holt, a well-known Tyrannosaur expert, noted that the chest was so broad on a mature Tyrannosaurus that the effective strike zone of the swiping arms couldn't be far from the animal's torso. He didn't however doubt the potential damage if they did strike, but in order to actually deploy them, they would have to essentially push their chest up against the side of the victims, and in such a position, they wouldn't have been able to use their more powerful weapon, being their massive and powerful jaws, as their necks would be too far in front of them to both hold on to their prey and then bite down. During their juvenile years, however, Holtz concluded that as a juvenile animal, Tyrannosaur arms would have been larger proportionally relative to their body size, and therefore may have been more useful for them, with the strike zone being proportionally larger, meaning going after smaller prey and grasping them would have been much easier. The arms, while comparatively powerful compared to ours, around three and a half times stronger, were nowhere near comparable to the massive size of the body and the immense jaws, which would almost certainly be prioritised over the small hands for grasping, when they could simply just use their massive skull and neck muscles to grab onto and hold prey in place. When compared to a Triceratops as an example, a Tyrannosaurus running up to the animal and essentially rubbing against it only to inflict comparatively minor damage simply is nowhere near as efficient and safe as simply letting the jaws do the work and shifting around the animal to get a bite in, especially when some of their prey had formidable weaponry. As mentioned, Tyrannosaurs do indeed possess proportionally larger feats than other theropods, but instead of just being the case to knock over other animals, it comes down to the mass of them, as since Tyrannosaurs were so large, being able to reach over 9 tons in weight, it would make sense that to support such weights, their feet would therefore have to be larger to support this, and also to propel their frames forward as they moved. Also, when it comes to grasping prey that some have proposed, animals that are suited to grappling with and bringing down their prey through their weight are like big cats, have proportionally long front limbs and exceptional coordination and flexibility to hold onto their prey. With their proportionally long limbs, better coordination, stout necks, as well as five flexible and strong fingers, all features that Tyrannosaurs lack and indicates they were not the most able predators in that regard. The arms of Tyrannosaurs, while indeed fairly strong, had a limited range of motion, side to side and up and down, based off biomechanical studies, and the wrists were also considerably weaker and seemingly not well suited for supporting large loads or holding on to prey. Aside from the grasping and or mating hypotheses, some have suggested that Tyrannosaurs retained their arms to help them push up off the ground if they were laying down or knocked over. The idea goes back to Barney Newman, a paleontologist who worked at what is now London's Natural History Museum. In 1970, soon after the increased interest in dinosaurs and their study, Newman wrote a short paper on the newly understood horizontal posture, and also claims to have found a use for the short arms. The heavy construction of the arms and shoulder girdles were noted by Newman that they were strong, and that all of the muscle and bone acted as a set of brakes. At rest, Newman suspected, Tyrannosaurs sat in a kind of crouch, with the legs being folded under the body much in the same way as a bird, with the lower jaw on the ground and with the palms held flat. When the dinosaur then stood up, the role of the forelimbs was that of a brake holding the body, so that the force exerted by the extension of the hind limbs was then transmitted to the pelvic region, and therefore pushing them upwards. 
Some have however misinterpreted this view, that they would have used the four parts of their bodies to push up off the ground, although, as Newman states, the idea was that they stabilised them as they stood up and extended their legs. Although, even so, Newman's theory isn't as conclusive as some may think. In Newman's reconstruction, the wrists of the animals made the hands face palms down, which would not have given them some grip as they stood. What we now know is that theropod wrists could not articulate this way, and that as paleontologists have pointed out, theropod palms faced inwards and towards each other, flexed as bird wrists are. Track marks from other theropods in a sitting position confirm this, as do other smaller theropod skeletons preserved in the act of nesting and or resting. In order to achieve a palms down grip on the ground, tyrannosaurs would have had to swing their arms far out to the sides, so that they came into the right position. Sitting in a bird-like position, there is also no evidence that tyrannosaurs needed extra stabilisation to stand up. Although little technical work has been done, it is likely that the release of energy stored in the Achilles tendons did allow them to stand without utilising their arms, and with their heavy tails and thick heads, were counterbalanced over their hips, and so probably sat down and stood up in the typical theropod manner, just utilising their legs instead of their arms as a steadying method. Others have found that due to possessing a large skull, the muscle attachments would therefore have to be larger, but as neck and arm muscles compete for muscle attachment space across the bones of the shoulders, the arms over the course of natural selection would favour animals that have a great counterbalance, favouring those animals with more powerful jaws, and therefore smaller, less muscle extensive arms, and that they were therefore an evolutionary trade-off. In this case, the small arms were actually the keys to the power and ferocity of the animals, rather than being an unusual defect that hampers them or did nothing. There is also the case to be made that the arms were simply vestigial and had no purpose whatsoever, like the hind limbs of cetaceans and the wings of kiwi. This would have held some merit when the arms were first known of in other animals and little theorising had been done, but with all of what has been mentioned before, there was at least some benefit or evolutionary advantage to possessing these arms, and this is also well supported by the recently discovered Gualicho, which although not being the most well known taxonomically, was still quite distinct from tyrannosaurs, and interestingly also possessed small two-fingered hands, indicating that whatever the function was, there was indeed some purpose that they were being used for, to be maintained not just in these unrelated animals, but in tyrannosaurs. And lastly, there are some interesting findings that tyrannosaurs may have utilised their arms in intraspecific combat, indicating they were opportunistic and active fighters, using every useful part of their body to ward off rivals. Grooves on the surfaces of the nasal bones of Monty and Scotty, two Tyrannosaurus specimens have orientations that were found to have been made by the manual claw of a conspecific, and that's the attack was from the front. There are many other examples, and all are incompatible with tooth movement, indicating that the Tyrannosaurs were very close to one another to inflict these wounds. Of course, evolution doesn't often favour a feature for one singular purpose, and the arms of Tyrannosaurs could most definitely have been utilised for most of the ideas listed earlier, and that they could have been used for multiple means. They were clearly developed for some function as seen in the previously mentioned Gualicho, and were retained in some form unlike Abelosaur arms, which were undoubtedly vestigial and likely served little to no function in their lives. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.